Hong Kong's media was once considered the freest in Asia, but violence and a rise in cases of alleged censorship have shocked the city, triggering concerns that moves are being made to muzzle the media. I'm Steve Chow. On this edition of 101 East, we ask, what does the future hold for Hong Kong's outspoken press? It was once home to Asia's freest press. But no longer. And for this crowd, the situation is unacceptable. Hong Kong ranked 18th on the Reporters Without Borders Press Freedom Index in 2002. Twelve years on, it's fallen to 61st on that list. Many blame interference by the Chinese government. More and more people are willing to cooperate with Beijing to create a press situation here that is less critical of uh, the communist regime up there. 明報換老總, Developments at the start of this year triggered more anxiety. Kevin Lau, the chief editor of local daily newspaper Ming Pao, was abruptly dismissed. <laughs> Weeks later, outspoken radio show host and government critic Li Wai Ling also lost her job. She pointed the finger at Hong Kong's chief executive. The uproar over the erosion of press freedom comes at a politically sensitive time for Hong Kong. China has promised to grant the special administrative region universal suffrage by 2017. Many here believe that Beijing isn't likely to keep its word and that attempts to undermine the media are a sign of things to come. I always believe and say that when there's no more press freedom, no other freedom is safe. It's a sentiment that resonates with many gathered here today. Hong Kong's constitution guarantees its residents freedoms not seen elsewhere in China. There is now a genuine fear that things could change. Three days later, some shocking news. Kevin Lau, whose dismissal from Ming Pao sparked the protest, is in hospital the victim of a vicious cleaver attack. The attack sparks an even bigger protest. Hong Kong is a relatively safe city, but in the past year alone, there have been more than half a dozen reported cases of violence against journalists and media outlets. More than 10,000 protesters march on police headquarters in a show of support for Lao. So the journalists are saying that they are facing unprecedented pressure and attacks. So that's why so many people have come out today to support them. Eleven suspects have been arrested and a trial will be underway soon. Investigators have worked tirelessly around the clock but authorities have been reluctant to link the incident with Lau's work as a journalist. But until you find out what were the reasons for such an indecent act, you cannot make the claim as a journalist uh, or as a news uh, 
you cannot just reporting on what you feel. Uh, give me the facts. Kevin Lau remains in hospital. He has to learn to walk again. Each step is a tiny victory. Lau's nerves were badly damaged during the attack, and doctors say he may need more surgery. The road to recovery is still long and uncertain. Human nerves grow very slowly, just one millimeter each day. So it may take a year or even two years for my feet and toes to resume basic functionality. I cannot comment on the case until it's over. But I would like to urge the Hong Kong police force to use every possible means to investigate and find out the mastermind behind the scene, the person who ordered the attack on an innocent journalist in broad daylight. The attack on Lao has unnerved many in the media. The first time we meet Edward Chin, he's with the police. The front door of his office building has been smashed and he's making a report. Now at this point, I don't want to make any assumption. And I just um, reported to the police just uh, two hours ago and uh, just came back from the police station. Chin is a hedge fund manager, but he's also a columnist, pro-democracy activist and radio show host. Do you personally support the freedom of speech, no matter which country? He often uses his shows as platforms to discuss issues close to his heart. But he says it's become increasingly difficult for people in the media to speak their minds. In a weekly uh, column that I write, um, I was uh, told um, not to focus too much on politics or current affairs. Just focus on your know, long short trading strategies. And then I, it, it came to me at a surprise that happened a few months ago. And I think the that it's because of the mainland influence. In April this year, Chin decided to take action. He and some 70 colleagues from the finance industry wrote an open letter to the Chinese government setting out 10 requests. Among them, that Beijing respect Hong Kong's right to free speech and a free press. For us as a group in the financial and um, banking sectors, uh, freedom of information, freedom of press is especially important for us. I think uh, for investment, is at the end of the day, is gathering information uh, and to make uh, informative decisions. Uh, so uh, if there's no freedom of speech, uh, I think we will jeopardize um, Hong Kong as the international uh, finance center. The group is also part of Occupy Central, a movement that's vowed to hold civil disobedience protests if China backtracks on its promise to let Hong Kongers choose their own leader by 2017. Today, they're voting on proposals for a referendum on how Hong Kong's election candidates should be nominated. It's a general increasing political tensions between Hong Kong and Beijing. And that that somehow, I mean, at the same time, we see a tightening of the media control. We are now discussing on ways to have this universal suffrage. And Beijing want to have a election where it can be certain of the result before the election was ha being held. But we want a, a, a truly uh, uh, democratic election that will re truly reflect the views of the people. Veteran Hong Kong journalist Ching Chong knows what it means to be on the wrong side of the Chinese government. In 2005, he was accused of spying on them for Taiwan, a charge he's consistently denied. Despite international protests, he spent nearly three years in prison in China. He's now retired, 
but plans to set up a website on press freedom in Hong Kong. Ching believes Beijing's attempts to influence public opinion started even before Hong Kong returned to Chinese rule in 1997. In the last days of the British colonial rule, media operators, knowing that major changes are coming, try to adapt to these changes by adjusting their editorial policy towards China. Then we also saw to prepare for this uh, uh, takeover of Hong Kong, China has already started co-opting um, uh, media operators in, in Hong Kong to join their uh, political game. More than half of Hong Kong's media owners hold political appointments in China. These include Charles Ho of the Sing Tao Group and Richard Lee, who owns 50% of the influential economic journal. Ming Pao, often cited as the city's most credible Chinese daily and Hong Kong's leading English newspaper, the South China Morning Post, are both controlled by Malaysian owners with significant business interests in China. The South China Morning Post's editor-in-chief, Wang Shangwei, is a former member of China's top advisory body, the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference. Wang came under fire in June 2012, when noisy protesters marched on the South China Morning Post. They accused him of downplaying news of the mysterious death of Chinese dissident Li Wangyang. The protest was sparked when emails between Wang and a sub-editor at the paper, Alex Price, began circulating online. In the first of several messages to his chief editor, Price asked, A lot of people are wondering why we nibbed the Li Wang Yang story last night. It does seem rather odd. Any chance you can shed some light on the matter? In one of his replies, Wang wrote, I don't have to explain to you anything. I made the decision and I stand by it. If you don't like it, you know what to do. Both Wang and Price declined our requests for interviews. But we meet a former journalist from the paper, Tim Hamlet. He had left the post by 2012, but after learning of the exchange between Price and Wang, Hamlet and 22 of his ex-colleagues sent an open letter to the paper's executive director detailing their concerns over the matter. Maybe Mr Wang sort of just, just glanced at the first paragraph and, and didn't realise what it was. But um, yeah, it was not the first time, not the first time that the Post had appeared to, to be influenced in its news values by a desire not to offend. There is one major Hong Kong newspaper with an owner who has no known business ties with China. Apple Daily, part of tycoon Jimmy Lai's next media group. If people knew the things he's been offered in China that I know about, you know, the, the, would you like to have this sports, this sports uh, information company? Would you like to do financial news? Would you like to do lifestyle news? He gets offered this stuff all the time, but he knows you can't really do it. It's one of Hong Kong's biggest newspapers and arguably one of its most vocal. Apple Daily and its sister publications are unabashedly pro-democracy and openly critical of authorities in Hong Kong and Beijing. A position, they say, has hurt advertising revenues. Some of these large companies have bent over for the Chinese HSBC, Standard Chartered, Bank of East Asia, Mercedes-Benz, um, large uh, large insurance companies, um, Chinese insurance companies, Sun Life, they've, they're gone. I think if within the right of the company or individual, in terms of where they want to or not want to put their uh, advertising money, okay, and the media who by and large operate as private uh, enterprises or personal enterprise, uh, also have the right to choose where they want to stand on certain issue, uh, who to criticize or who to praise, 
and they fully know the consequence, the economic consequence of their action in this marketplace. 即是在法庭那個那個那個派 It's just past 2 and the Apple Daily team is holding its afternoon news meeting. Chung Kim Hung is the paper's chief editor. Pro democracy, freedom, free market. This is the core value of our newspaper. There's no journalist ever come to me to, to tell me that oh I'm too scared I, I I don't want to do this reporting. No. No. There's good reason to be cautious. In June 2013, a stolen car was rammed into the front gate of Next Media founder Jimmy Lai's home. An axe and a machete were left outside. Less than two weeks later, knife-wielding masked men set fire to some 26,000 copies of Apple Daily at a distribution point. That same day, a cleaver was found outside the entrance of the company's building. The pressure that we get on us, really, we do not believe that it is always Beijing inspired. What we do believe, though, is that Beijing is receptive to it. In other words, this is people bringing gifts to Caesar. One floor down, Li Wailing is preparing for her new show. She was offered a job with Next Media shortly after being dismissed from commercial radio. Yip 这个大公报啊，大家都知道是一个爱国的啊，也就是清北京的政府。Senior editor Yip Chung Man has been at the paper for nearly fifty years. 这是我们今天的报纸。香港的问题呢，基本上政治问题啊、社会啊、啊民生啊，我都要写。这里两篇东西呢，就是我写的，因为最近香港有的人叫鼓吹叫学生去占领中环，教育局就说不能去，去了以后啊，影响你们将来的前途啊，升学就业，当公务员。当时是中华人民共和国国中央人民政府成立
更加走向这个是公平的。言论自由，言论自由，新闻自由，新闻自由，言论自由。But the Chinese government has never hidden its desire to control the media. Across the border from Hong Kong, angry protesters in Guangzhou staged an unprecedented demonstration against state censorship in early 2013. This after allegations that an article in the outspoken Southern Weekly newspaper had been doctored by the government. Among those accused of censoring the paper, propaganda official Yang Jian. Yang is now in Hong Kong, working at China's government liaison office. Reports say he's in charge of publicity and propaganda. He was seen recently in public, speaking in the aftermath of the attack on Kevin Lau. The exact reach and influence of the government liaison office is a subject of much speculation. It declined our request for an interview. But human rights activist and lawyer Martin Lee says the office is increasingly making its presence felt in Hong Kong. Effectively, it's no longer Hong Kong people ruling Hong Kong or governing this place, but uh, the Beijing uh, apparatchiks, Communist Party cadres housed in a building in the western part of Hong Kong called the Central Government Liaison Office. Now these people are running Hong Kong and, uh, and freedoms are clearly being infringed, particularly freedom of the press, uh, because no communist government likes a free press. It's the 25th anniversary of the June 4th crackdown in China. Muck Ying Ting and her fellow journalists are promoting their book in Victoria Park. They've called it People Will Not Forget, a collection of reports by Hong Kong journalists who were in Beijing when tanks started rolling towards Tiananmen Square. They sell hundreds of books today. A quarter of a century after the crackdown, people are still interested in learning more about it. The book could not sell in China, we, we all know that. But we have put the content of the book on the website. So we hope very much that the mainland people can cross over the Great Fire Wall and get access to the book and know what happened in 1989, to know the truth, to know the facts, so that they will not forget what happened. Hong Kong is the only Chinese city where June 4th can be openly commemorated and discussed. This gathering is an annual event, and this year draws an estimated 180,000 people. For activists and journalists in China, it's also a difficult time. Many were detained in the run-up to the anniversary. The June 4th crackdown remains a sensitive topic in the mainland, something Beijing would rather people not remember. It is very important for us to safeguard the press freedom in Hong Kong so that people will know what happened and trying to tell what we saw in Beijing to the world when the government trying to cover up everything. And so journalists like Mark are still speaking up. And though some might say that the space to do so is getting smaller, Hong Kong remains unique in a country that prefers to forget. Those who gather here are still able to light that candle, to speak their minds, and to remember.
for now at least.